Hi, this is Jake Lapp, Vice President of Member Accountability at ECFA. It's my privilege today to welcome you to the webinar, Top 10 Legal Considerations for a Post-Pandemic Church. This is such a critical and timely topic as our country moves forward towards reopening post-COVID. And because of that, we're pleased to have with us today a leading expert to walk us through these issues. Our special guest presenter is attorney Erika Cole, partner at Whiteford, Taylor, and Preston. Eureka has over 20 years of experience advising nonprofit and tax-exempt organizations in a broad range of legal matters, including charitable giving, governance, contracts and mergers. Known as the church attorney, she has dedicated her life to helping churches of all denominations and sizes, ensuring that their legal affairs are in order so they can focus on spreading their message serving their communities, and growing their ministries. I'm looking forward to hearing Eureka's insights on today's webinar. But first, what's a good legal webinar without a legal disclaimer? I should note that while Eureka is an attorney, the materials on today's webinar are provided for general information purposes only and are not a substitute for legal advice, particular to your situation. No recipients of this information should act or refrain from acting solely on the basis of this webinar without seeking professional legal counsel. Before we continue much further, I'd like to just pause and say a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for all of those that are present today on this webinar. We are thankful that you have brought us together today to discuss this critical topic. I pray a special blessing over Erika today as she shares on this important topic. Please give us wisdom to navigate these critical legal issues as we continue to model integrity and glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Without further ado, I'll turn it over today to our special guest presenter, presenter Erika Cole. Erika, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Jake. It does sound much cooler to be a presenter, so. Um... <laughs> no problem there. So grateful to be with everyone today. Um, I'm right outside Washington, D.C., and it's a beautiful spring day here. Um, it's warming up. People are coming out more, and that kind of aligns with, um, gratefully, where we are, where we see ourselves, I believe, um, moving toward a post-COVID operation. Um, so I'm happy to be able to share with um, your members um, this presentation on the top 10 legal considerations as we move toward um, and see churches operate in a post-COVID environment. I do want to start at the beginning, perhaps, <laughs> and um, maybe set this up by stating the obvious that COVID changed everything. Um, we all um, experienced um, globally mandatory shutdowns, experiences of shortages, experiences of having to shift the way we work, the way we worship, the way we interact, or, um, or the lack thereof, um, largely. And so from a legal standpoint, as you can appreciate, the law often takes a while to evolve um, in any particular area. So I want to couch today's discussion recognizing that while we have built a level of new case law surrounding COVID and its implications, my true belief, and there are many other attorneys and judges who would support this, is that it will take many years for cases to meander through the system for us to get case law that helps us understand what things may look like going forward. So I wanna be clear that this is a glimpse in time and much like many things surrounding COVID, it, it changes and sometimes quite quickly. Um, but we all sort of got a lesson in, um, you know, back to like our, our, our 10th grade civics class on federal, state, and local laws. We were hearing 
certain regulations on the federal level, and then matters that were deferred to the states, and then states often deferring to those local governments or local municipalities. And so as we were trying to figure out these mandatory shutdowns and to what degree are we balancing on the one hand, government's right to ensure public health and safety, not only their right, but responsibility of governments to ensure the, the health, safety and welfare of, of, its, of its people. Um, but on the other hand, for churches, we were making it very clear that we want to ensure that religious freedom is not overly impacted or subjected to unnecessary government regulation. And so that's where we really get um, a lot of the rub and some of the activity that we've seen in the courts. Now, as you all well know, um, when a case comes to the court, right? So in this instance, that might look like a local church that has decided it will not shut down or maybe it chose to short shut down. I'll give you this example, a church that did shut down for a period of time, but after a period of time decided that they had done all the things that were necessary to allow its members to return. And so the church opened um, in defiance of local law. Um, it was then the, this particular church example, they were, they were cited by the local government and um, what happens next is you go into, generally speaking, federal court. And on the federal court level, again, there's this balancing act of the church arguing that the laws infringe upon religious freedom and the government, on the other hand, saying that they have done only what is necessary and nothing more to protect and ensure public health and safety. And so um, in, in this instance, um, we see a victory on the government level. And then the next thing is an appeal. And again, generally every jurisdiction has a federal appellate level that is after, um, you know, that's sort of that, that middle level and and then ultimately a case would if the supreme court granted a writ of certiorari would be heard by the supreme court and that of course would be the law of the land so as you can imagine um that process does not happen overnight moreover the supreme court as we well know only hears a small fraction of the cases that are appealed to it so this is going to take time and what we know um, at this point is that um, in some jurisdictions, I'm sure many of you are probably thinking about California and the cases that have come out of, out of that um, jurisdiction, the, the courts um, are expected to um, have a favorable reflection of making sure that religious freedom is protected but also balancing out government rights. So um, that's sort of what, what got us all started. Next slide. I don't know if I can move this, thank you. Um, so moving to post-COVID operations, um, we're, it's going to take time for us to look anything like, um, like normal, quote unquote, I'm putting air quotes here. And, and probably normal will not be what we, um, experience prior. So of course, the whole idea of telework had, you know, became the new normal. Um, the reality of people working from home, um, the people also educating from home. I will say for myself, I have two school-age sons and that was 
very interesting um, to both have have the entire family at home. My husband is working on one level and with one kid next door, and I'm working on um, the lower level uh, with uh, one kid next to me. And that's just, we just made it work. Um, but the truth is these, these back to work issues um, are, are considerations that I'm hearing from my clients that are causing as many issues as when we had to shift to home as, as now that we are shifting back to work. So what does that look like? That looks like the fact that it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle, right? So 14 months of working from home. Um, people have, many people have gotten comfortable in their fuzzy socks or their um, slippers and um, maybe a nice shirt and comfortable pants. Um, and so, um, and they have found extra time in their lives. So the commute, again, especially here in the D.C. area and many other areas around the country, the commute was a big um time loss and they're just sort of seeing these other ways that they have been able to to do life more efficiently and actually want to consider some level of continuity in the telework so if in fact uh, our church will consider a policy regarding um telework Ensure that you're, you're you, you, I want to give you three points that you want to make sure are included when discussing telework. Um, and the first is who, who would be eligible? How, who's actually going to be eligible for telework? So that could be um, based on specific job description. That can be people who all are in one particular category. So, for example, IT, you may decide that all of the IT people are eligible to work from home because of the kind of work they do, by, for example. Um, ultimately, number two, you want to make sure you reduce whatever the policy is to writing, right? Because if you haven't adopted a policy, then, then this is absolutely the time to do so. And, and I will say many organizations had presumed that the only way workers could be effective and actually be productive is by being in the office. And frankly, we have found that's probably not the case. Um, and so many organizations that I'm working with are finding that they do want to have some sort of policy to allow for, for telework and put that policy in writing. And then number three, you want to make sure that you have a way to ensure that your policy is consistently applied to all employees. We know that one of the top ways um, we have employment challenges, um, HR issues, is when policies are either not properly adopted or more often um, not properly applied. So you want to make sure that you go through those 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 three things. And then back to church issues. So we talked about your employees returning, but what about the membership, um, visitors, volunteers, etc. Um, so the issues that we're considering there obviously is making sure um, number one that your return to church as best you can comports with the federal, state, and local laws governing this return. And number two, that you can easily demonstrate that you are following the regulations that are industry standards. So what that means generally is CDC, World Health Organization, and maybe the local health organization where your church resides. So those are gonna be the critical considerations as you're putting together back to church. I saw the recent poll that came up about whether your church is back to in-person gatherings. And I've done any number of webinars and trainings and shared information around that 
early on, but what I am finding is that most churches are back to some level of in-person gatherings. I will say for my church, I think they did a fantastic job of easing into it. So initially we had one service um, that was a shorter service that people registered to attend a limited number. And again, you wanna make sure you work out any kinks on at that level. And then we expanded the number of people who could be there. Then we ultimately expanded the number of services. So most churches in my experience, and I'd be curious to see what the polls show. Um, Jake, I don't know if you can share that out, but I'd be curious to see what the poll showed. But in my experience, most, most churches have returned on some level. Look, it looks, or we got, it looks like around 90% of churches are back open. Yeah. The respondents. That, okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's, that's along the lines of what I, what I would expect at this point. Um, so, and then back questions around vaccinations. Um, I've, I've been, <laughs> I've been swamped with those considerations, especially since the latest CDC guideline that came out a week ago. So I'll say for my part, I am as of today, two weeks post my second vaccination. And, um, and many of us are finding some relief <laughs> in being um, among, among those who are vaccinated. And there are others who either cannot be vaccinated, and perhaps that's for medical reasons, or who choose to not be vaccinated, and that can just be for their personal beliefs. Sometimes it's for religious reasons. And so the question then becomes, can an organization limit attendance to only those individuals who are vaccinated? And what we are seeing, again, remember what I said early on, is it's gonna take a while for some of these things to work their way through the system in terms of getting, getting definitive questions, perhaps from the highest authority. But my experience has been um, in the jurisdictions in which I have had opportunity to review this is yes, employers can, can limit um, or, or can specifically say the office is strongly encouraging everyone to be vaccinated and for, for example, you can specify we want to have vaccinated individuals if we're having, let's say, an indoor um, recital or an indoor cantata or something to that effect. So these questions, though, related to vaccinations, I want to go back to that initial discussion that we do have to consider federal, state, and local guidelines. So just like everything about COVID, it's not easy, but I want to raise the questions and give you some, some um, ways to consider working through these matters. All right, next slide. Financing church operations, um, again, we have seen that COVID in a lot of ways allowed churches to see that there are ways to be um, very functional, very effective, and to that givers remained committed throughout COVID. I, I had a very interesting conversation with um, a fellow attorney who represents um, nonprofits broadly, not specifically churches. And he was saying how surprised he was that in the church community, they didn't see the stark drop in giving throughout COVID, even though people weren't able to go to church. And I believe that ECFA, um, Jake, you can fact check me, don't mean to put you on, uh, uh, on the spot, but ECFA has shared um, very good information around giving um, through the course of COVID from churches and nonprofits, and it remained very strong. So those churches, I believe ECFA has said, and I have 
have also seen and experienced that had remote giving options already had a lot more success at navigating the shift to um, what I guess I'll call home church, or at least not being in church um, in person. So those remote giving options could be like my church actually, I, I always gave, uh, you know, we would always use our church app and it had a give, you know, click here to give option. And we just continued using that same process. Some churches early on, and, and I'm sure you all can, can recall the early days, they would allow the building to be open just for, to have people drop off from a certain period or people had drive by drop off for their offerings, um, tithes and offerings or giving. And, but by and large, um, whether you're using Givelify or, you know, I guess I won't mention any specific options, but there are a lot of options that, that existed um, that were utilized through this process. I do want to add a parenthetical and I, I, I is that every way to give may not be a proper way to give. So for example, sending something to an individual's cash app account, for example, would not be a proper giving tool for a church. So you want to make sure that in any remote giving option, I'm so sorry, I need to make sure my phone is off. Uh, let me put myself on do not disturb. Apologies, hopefully you can edit that out or something. <laughs> um, but we do wanna make sure that all of the giving options are tied directly to the church or the nonprofit connected to its EIN and not to any individual. Moving on then to the PPP loans um, and the PPP loan forgiveness. That was also a very exciting time, right? We were trying to figure out what are these SBA rules and to whom do they apply? And we know that the first round of information did not expressly include churches, nonprofits, and tax exorbitant tax exempt organizations. It referenced and was focused upon the business community, which clearly is important, but we can all appreciate the work of nonprofits, the work of churches is critical. And we saw that a lot of folks got on the horn, dealt with this issue, and we saw that the next level of guidance made clear that churches and other tax exempt organizations who met the eligibility requirements could apply for and receive PPP loans. Likewise, obviously, if you have received a loan, um, then the loan forgiveness process, um, again, we recall that, it, and we're still getting information about how these things are changing over time, but I saw um, a lot of success with clients who applied for PPP loans and were able to keep things moving along in a healthy way as a result. So um, so I, I would say that was a, a point of success um, in large part. Again, not everyone I'm sure applied, not everyone I imagine qualified, but um, I personally observed clients who um, we were able to exist, uh, assist on both sides of that process with, with good success. So, so that was um, a, a positive. Next slide, please. So now I wanna talk about something else that we're seeing coming out of COVID. And as we are anticipating what life might look like in this post COVID existence. And church mergers are certainly on the increase. And I imagine if you on the on the call here on this webinar who can point to um, churches that you know have merged. Um, it's happening with an increased frequency. And I think it's just important for for you to know that that it can be an option um, for a church as much as it could be for any other type of organization. So I have said that the steadily changing landscape and, and the makeup of church in America, along with oh, the impact of the 
global pandemic, which, you know, those impacts I think are going to be with us for some time. Um, it's prompted many churches to, to consider what what's the future going to look like long term, right? So even prior to the pandemic, there were churches who had concerns about their lasting viability, um, the reality. Uh, we've all seen the numbers about decreased membership as a result, um, you know, decline in revenues and, uh, and ultimately difficulty in moving forward with the programming that that these funds, uh, you know, that it takes to, to um, these funds to, to operate. So um, a, a church merger might be a, a great option for a church that's, that's having difficulty um, continuing forward, um, but it's also um, a, an option for a healthy church that's looking for a way to expand its footprint um, to maybe expand it to another jurisdiction, another location, a great way to expand its um, level of diversity, for example. Um, so all of those are important considerations when it comes to um, a merger. And I, I know that sometimes that, that word can give the impression of, you know, it's this hardcore movie-like acquisition, but it, it needn't be. Um, it can be one church that's merging into another church. It could be a church that chooses um, to, to dissolve. Maybe it's a church that, that has a facility, but limited numbers of people there, and it may dissolve and, and leave its assets to church B and, and, and look to help grow um, that ministry. And there's another option where, where the churches could come together and create something brand new. So it really is a situation where the form is going to follow the substance, right? It's going to depend on the actual facts in any, in any you know, given circumstance. And I will say that, you know, no matter which option is selected, um, it, it, it is something that can um, allow churches to use resources in a helpful way, in a more efficient way. So when we talk about the process for considering it, um, those three options might be on the table um, for, for consideration. Next slide. Yeah, I may, I may just interrupt real quick, Erika, with a question. Um, uh -huh. yeah, you mentioned that mergers are increasing. So are there some foundational actions that churches or, or ministries that may be listening in could take if they're considering a merger? Good question. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you want to make sure that both churches are healthy, right? So you want to operate from a perspective of of what can we do to make sure that both churches are in a healthy place to move forward. So that can mean that we are ensuring that all of our governance documents, for example, are in place, are up to date. So your, if your church is incorporated, can you put your hands on those articles of incorporation and any amendments? Your governance document, that generally means your bylaws, um, any policies, those all of those things are in place. If you have employees, um, do you have an employee handbook? Um, are you actually operating with any employment contracts? Any of those considerations? You want to just make sure you um, are as orderly as possible in your internal functionality as you consider moving forward. And then ultimately, um, consider, obviously prayerfully consider, is there a church that may share the same vision or seem to have a similar church culture that um, where, where, where two um, maybe can come together and, and maybe have an increased impact for the kingdom? So those are some considerations there, Jake. No, that's great. And then I know this was a question we'll probably get, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it now. <laughs> Are there any resources that, that you can share that you know of that may be helpful um, into this type of activity? Yeah, sure. Um, 
Well, I, I will say that um, a, I actually had the opportunity to um, share a webinar last week on church mergers um, with church law and tax. And I know that that's an organization that, um, you know, some of your listeners may also be familiar with, but I had a chance to um, provide a four part series um, with a fantastic um, free download that I think could be very helpful. So I would um, point to that resource. And um, there's also very good information. You know that um, Barna tends to do a lot of studies and, and research around this issue, and they have great data that I would have people, um, you know, take a look at online about what the future of church could look like in, in, in the realm of mergers. Great. Thanks. You're welcome. Moving on to our, our, our next slide, um, HR and staffing difficulties. Um, it's very interesting because there's a reality of perhaps a shrinking pool of employees for churches and, um, and just the overall difficulties of, of staffing because we do have the law on our side when it comes to being able to select staff members who agree to the um, to align with the religious tenets of our organization right so we know that we can specifically identify workers who agree with our religious tenets um, because of the changes that we're seeing in our country, um, sometimes that positive um, has been difficult because actually finding that pool of employees has been increasingly difficult. So that ties into what I was saying around the religious considerations. We do have that right to limit, um, limit our workers to those individuals who adhere to our religious beliefs at the same time, um, sorry, I lost my slide. At the same time, that that reality is that we we just have fewer of those those numbers, or at least what we've been told is finding those workers is more difficult. And I want to also just address some of the complexities surrounding um, remote work for church work workers as well. So you know, we want to consider maybe having as a part of that policy that I mentioned earlier, um, maybe it would be important to have more regular check-ins with your employees. And when I say check-ins, maybe I should say more specifically, any of those point touch points for evaluations. Often those things in a pre-COVID world would happen one time, right? So we would normally review, have a, an employee review at the end of the year, for example, maybe some organizations might do that mid-year and end of the year. In the remote working environments and post-COVID, I would say I would strongly encourage considering having increased points of check-in. One, um, it can be difficult to, to, to know exactly um, how effective or efficient someone is being at home. In, in some in some work environments. I would also suggest as a part of that policy that we mentioned, you wanna be clear about some standard work hours, right? So this is a question we've gotten. Some employees will say, you know, church employees or nonprofit employees, you know, well, since I'm working at home, I might find that my better work time is from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. Well, that's interesting, but a part of work, as we know, is being able to connect with others, being able to bounce information off of others, being able to get responses back when you send information out. And, and if someone's peak working hour is midnight, that may not um, comport with, with the rest of the team. So you may want to have just sort of, um, you know, if you want to offer flexibility, that's fine, but you may, may decide to say, everyone needs to be on the online at least between the hours of 10 and 3 
for example, and then you could sort of flex your time otherwise. We do know that um, childcare and those who are working at home um, when the schools uh, are still not fully open um, in many areas, it, it, you may want to figure out a way that you can both support the employee as well as ensure um, that the mission and operations of the church are moving forward. Next slide, please. So I, I think it would be um, remiss if we didn't address here in mental health May, uh, so May being the, the month that we specifically give reflections on mental health, um, to talk about um, COVID fatigue and um, pastoral burnout and that shrinking pastoral pool um, that unfortunately seems to um, align with with the overall shrieking religious workers, at, at least from the data that I've been able to see. So there, there's a report um, from the Schaefer Institute that indicated um, 1,700 pastors leave the ministry each month, citing depression, burnout, or being, being overworked. Um, and we know that pastors have had to um, be heroes in a whole different way, right? They've had to demonstrate a whole level of resiliency and creativity and, and, and overall, you know, grit um, as we are moving through um, COVID and now as they are trying to figure out um, what their operations should look like post-COVID. So COVID fatigue has been very um, and again, what we are seeing, this, this research comes from, from Barna and it looks like it's just about a year old. Um, they did um, the state of, of pastors research and they showed that seven in 10 US pastors agree it's becoming harder to find mature young Christians who want to become pastors. So, um, so we're talking, you know, close to 70 percent. Um, that's a that's obviously a notable number, and I think what that means is, um, and what I'm hearing from the the pastors and the churches that I work with is the level of intentionality that is necessary, the level of connection that is necessary to from from that senior pastor, that lead pastor to younger pastors and, and those who we are looking toward when it comes to succession, being more deliberate about connecting with those who, who, who we would hope to bring along is really going to be critical in this post-COVID church. Next slide. So church property matters. As you are considering the post-COVID church, there's, there's, there's a great likelihood that church property is going to be on your list. I am um, within the firm. I connect with the corporate section, the nonprofit section, and specifically as relates to this, I'm a part of the subgroup on, on um, real estate matters. And without fail, in, in every commercial industry, and obviously church property is under the umbrella of commercial, um, it's been impacted by, by COVID because, again, not being able to be present. But what we've also found is maybe the, the amount of space we have may not be what we need post-COVID because the church largely moved out to the community. And I have a lot of church clients who are keeping some level of that model. So first looking at churches that rent. Some churches that, that rented space, if we're talking about schools or if we're talking about um, other kinds of centers or um, you know, maybe some, some government facility, they just weren't able to get in. 
um, even when there were changes related to, um, you know, now facilities can open, but at a limited capacity, many of those that rented did, felt that they, they had decreased autonomy. And so that is changing how some churches are choosing to move forward. I have um, a number of clients, church clients who were able to save significantly during COVID, and now they are taking advantage of the market to buy. So that may be one scenario um, as relates to, to church matters. Um, and then churches that own. Again, the question of is what we have, what we will need going forward? Is it too much? Is it too little? And um, having that whole evaluation during this time is going to be critical because uh, some people are finding that they believe they can meet their ministry goals, they can meet their um, program goals better by maybe shedding some of the property and moving some of those resources more into operations and, and programming. Next slide. So um, I see that I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna try to, to get through these final slides. Um, digital operations will, They'll, they'll be expected to, to remain. So even as the U.S. specifically, um, just where I am and focused on at the moment, um, it will continue to open, I believe. Um, the level of um, access, <laughs> desired access to remote access to church, I think is going to continue. People are going to continue to want the option, whether it's because they are traveling with their family over the holidays or over summer break, and they still want to be able to access church, whether it's because, frankly, some people have gotten comfortable um, being at church and feel just like it's, you know, for some people related to school, some students feel that they've been more effective at home than in the classroom. Um, I'm not going to debate <laughs> that. Um, we as a family have decided to uh, return to church, but I know that uh, some people are making different decisions. And I think it is important in the post-COVID world for churches to realize there is going to be an expectation of continued operations remotely. And we should be prepared to deal with complexities related to returning to church. Um, again, I'm running out of time, so I won't be able to dig into that a bunch. But what I would want to say is it is important to communicate, 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 right? You're going to want members, visitors, people who come to your church to know you have prepared for them. As we know, COVID did impact some groups disparately, and those groups may have less. Um, ease in just dropping the mask, dropping all the restrictions and, and, and resuming quote unquote business as usual. So just consider those complexities, which actually leads into our next slide. Um, black and brown people, racial justice issues. I think we saw this um, in great measure, obviously, over the course of um, our, our COVID experience and, um, you know, specifically, I guess, at a heightened point related to the, the death of George Floyd and then the trial and just all of the civil unrest in, you know, at the U.S. Capitol and just a, a myriad of things. So we had a very contentious presidential election and everybody's taking all this stuff in virtually. It's been complicated. Um, and what we also know statistically is that the U.S. is really on the brink of being a, you know, again, I wish you could see my air quotes, uh, a majority minority country, right? So what we know is probably in the next 20 years, a majority of the people in this country will be black and brown people. And what is the church um, you know, how is the church work, working to reflect that and give voice to um, those racial justice considerations? Because um, certainly uh, this generation, my kids' generation, um, are, are looking to the church to have, have that voice. Um, next slide, and then I think I'll have to pause for questions. So what now? Um, which way do we go? Like, 
um, obviously God is with us, right? So while I, for one, was certainly caught off guard by COVID and all the new language that I have and uh, way of operating of ordering my food online. And, and um, yeah, I guess we still do have a lot of toilet paper um, and just all the things. Um, but I think we want to use this as an opportunity to quiet ourselves um, and, and see what God has for us because he does have a good plan for his church, as might be believed. He does have a good plan, um, I think, for, for how we continue to reach um, unreached people and also be a support um, to believers. And so I trust that this session has um, been of value. And um, I think now, Jake, I turn it back over to you. All right. Well, thanks, Erika. This has been great. I know that there's a lot of information to fit into an hour. So good job on working through that. And I'm sure we have, there's probably more questions that are on their way for those that still want to submit a question. You still can. Uh, webinar, you can email those to webinar at ecfa.org. And a few questions we've already received. Um, going kind of back to the beginning of the presentation when you talked about vaccination and all of that entails. Is it a HIPAA violation to ask someone if they've been vaccinated? Great question. Um, yeah, so I think that people probably um, are familiar with the term HIPAA, but I just want to maybe give a bit more context. So HIPAA is the Health Information Privacy Act. And so what it specifically governs is how health information is transferred between folks that actually um, healthcare providers. So since churches aren't healthcare providers, HIPAA doesn't apply here. But I think maybe if I were to guess um, really what this question gets to is whether it's okay to ask if someone was vaccinated. And again, in the jurisdictions when where I've had opportunity to review this question, the answer has been yes. Okay, great. Well, here's oh, another man, one coming. Can I just add oh. one more thing to that? Yeah. I think what we've also had difficulty around, and again, we're still trying to figure out how, how this, this will work out, is what level of proof then might we require? Right. So it's one thing to ask, have you been vaccinated? And then have the person say yes. Then to move to the next level of saying, well, show me your vaccine card. Again, okay. surprisingly, in the jurisdictions where um, where I've had a chance to look at this, um, you could probably go there, although I would not recommend it. So there All you right. Go. Well, kind of the same topic, uh, are there, you know, as, as, your, as churches are looking at opening back up and um, even bringing people back to work, maybe for churches and ministries that may be listening in, are there, you had mentioned different clients and conversations, are there common concerns you're hearing from those, from those clients about coming back to work? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm hearing concerns um, from maybe two sides of the coin. So from the, the church side or the employer side, I'm hearing concerns around liability, of course, right? Because that's, that's really what this goes to, of them having, you know, less than restrictions, maybe not having social distancing, maybe not having masks and all those things, if that is what their local jurisdiction allows. Um, but being concerned, at, because obviously we know COVID you know, didn't vanish, right? It's, it's still here. So on the church side, I'm hearing questions about liability concerns. Do we need to still have a level of cleaning? Do we need to um, continue with minimizing meetings and, and should we perhaps not have, you know, food at meetings as we've done in the past? All those kinds of things I'm hearing from church clients. As relates to the employees, and I would also put in the same category volunteers because the law doesn't treat them as differently as you might anticipate. So um, I would say for employees and volunteers, the concerns are 
one, do I have, do I have to go back? <laughs> that, that's, that's one of the bigger questions we're seeing right now. Is it, you know, can, can I be mandated? Um, number two, um, if I am not vaccinated, what could happen to me? Um, three questions around, well, can, can I continue with telework on some level? Right, you know, you know, what might that look like? Can I ask for an accommodation? Would be the language that we reference in the legal world. So, so as you can see, I mean, we're we're talking about a bevy of considerations on both sides of the point. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk, go back into church mergers here. What about merging across state lines? Um, are there any any suggestions there? Just any. Any words of wisdom for anyone listening in that may have that type of scenario? Oh yeah, we work with within that scenario all the time, and and that that can be a fantastic outcome for expanding that footprint of a church. As I that that language you may have heard me use as I was referencing this, we have seen that um, one of the greatest increases in in church property and in, in the use of church property and in, in the purchase of church property or expansion of church property is under the context of mergers so working across state lines now it does add a level of complexity as you can imagine from a legal standpoint right because you are having to adhere to merger laws on the federal side and then in both of the jurisdictions where the churches operate. So it, without a doubt, does add to the level of, of complexity, but at the same time, it could be a beautiful um, marriage of sorts um, from, from churches to be able to connect communities in different states. And may I add that for some areas, again, I'm, I'm right outside of Washington, D.C., those lines are crossed all the time. Like I can be in D.C., Maryland, Virginia, all in the same day, no big deal. So, so when we say cross state lines, that can feel a little more blurred in some areas of the country than in others. So it can feel very natural, I guess, is ultimately what I'm saying. Great. Well, I know we kind of sped through topic number seven, which was property matters. And one question here is, are there other ways churches may use their property that they may not have considered pre-COVID? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, one thing we know for sure is COVID um, bought out the uh, it bought out the creativity in us all, right? We had to figure out new and um, exciting ways to do things. But, but sure, if if perhaps um, you know a church wants to, maybe it has more, you know, it has property that it believes it can have greater use from. Um, one one thing you may consider is is a cost sharing arrangement. And let me let me break that down a bit. So let's say uh, there's a church that has resources, um, a good bit of resources, maybe like office space or equipment, a, a nice size facility, um, maybe even staff, right? And so um, the church that that needs additional resources could enter into a cost sharing agreement with 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 the one church. So that is something that really should be considered, especially if the two churches have a similar mission, have a similar purpose, and maybe even if they serve, you know, in a similar way as it relates to programs. So I, I think that is something that should be considered. Um, a second option, kind of similar to the first, but it's a space sharing agreement. So again, in this instance, the two churches um identify one space that they could jointly use maybe at different you know times and they they share the cost so let's say you know if if, if the church is wanting to do some youth programming etc you may find a facility that's got 
um, maybe like great field space or indoor courts or a swimming pool or whatever. And you can make joint use of the space by, you know, a space sharing agreement. Um, and maybe I'll mention one, one last option is maybe a sublease. Um, and, and this is something that in concept, I think people will be very familiar with, but you know, if your church owns a facility that, that is underutilized and that could be defined by fewer people in the property than the property holds, right? So if you got a 250 seat church, maybe, you know, you're only using a third of it. Um, or if it's used only, you know, one day a week or two days a week, uh, a sublease could, could make a lot of sense because you could look to sublease a portion or, or the complete space. Um, and, and that could be a great way too, to see how you, you work together and maybe, you know, that leads to something else positive, but in, in any of these options and all of these options, you do want to make sure that you consult, um, appropriate counsel so that that agreement comports to, um, all of the, the necessary legal structures. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know we're getting close to the end of our time today, but uh, I did just want to give you the opportunity to share about your upcoming conference too, before we close. Yeah, thanks so much. So um, every year we've had, uh, probably for the past 12 or 13 years, um, I've uh, had the blessing of hosting um, the Church Compliance Conference. Um, it, it, it has been listed um, uh, among the, the top six church management conferences in the, in the country for 2021, and that's pretty neat. Um, we'd love to invite you to come. Back in January or so, when we had to make decisions about whether we'd have an in-person event, we decided to have the conference online this year as we did last year. Um, so um, you're welcome to join us from wherever you are. Um, I understand that um, ECFA will be sending out some information after this session if you'd like to um, receive our invitation. Um, and once registration opens, let us know. We'd be happy to have you. I should also mention that um, we've got some amazing speakers lined up. Um, we have Rich Hammer who is giving his Supreme Court um, summary of Supreme Court cases. And he he just has you glued um, to his every word. So that is going to be exciting. Um, so we welcome you to join. Oh, that's great. Well, I'll just have a few other short closings here before we, before we end. Um, as it relates to COVID-19 resources, you can continue to find all the latest resources from ECFA, like today's webinar will be posted out there, and more of our special resources that are getting updated frequently at ecfa.org backslash COVID-19. We're also really excited to be celebrating five years of our online community, Church Excel. Church Excel is a free resource for pastors and church administrators that offers eBooks, webinar recordings, tax guides, sample policies, board governance, and more. If you're not yet a part of this community, you can join today at the link on your screen. And while I have this opportunity, I also just wanna say a very sincere thank you to many of our over 2,500 ECFA members who are represented on today's webinar. For other friends who are with us today, now is a great time to take the next step in becoming accredited. In these days, when there's so much uncertainty, we know givers are looking for ministries of the highest integrity, that they can trust to steward their resources and see the kingdom advance. During this season, ECFA is continuing to waive the $500 application fee. To learn more, you can email us directly at apply at ecfa.org. Well, that brings us to the end of today's webinar, the top 10 legal considerations for a post-pandemic church. We hope this has been meaningful to you. You'll be receiving another email tomorrow with a link to the recording and other related materials. And lastly, I'd just like to thank Erika for her great presentation and insights and for each person who joined us today for this webinar. May God bless you as you continue to shine bright the light of Jesus Christ in these times. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for more finance, governance, and fundraising news and insights for your church or ministry.